it is a privilege to be able to minister the Word of God here with you today. And so I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans. I want to speak to you today from Romans chapter 12. And so I trust you have your Bible with you and that it is open in front of you and that you can follow along with me. You'll derive so much more from this message as your own Bible is open in your lap and you see with your own eyes into your own Bible that is in your hands. The title of this message is A Call to Commitment. And I want to begin by reading two verses that will be our focus this morning as we look together into the Word of God. It's a text with which I know you're very familiar. If you've been a Christian any length of time, you no doubt have heard this passage expounded. And it is a text to which we need to come back to repeatedly again and again and to have set before our hearts Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. He was converted to Christ at age 18. It was the result of watching his older brother die. His older brother died with a supernatural peace in his heart, something that he himself did not possess. And this young man, 18 years of age, was so impacted by the strong faith of his older brother and the calm spirit with which he faced death, that he would later reflect upon his own deathbed. That day, 11 years ago, I lost my loved and loving brother and began to seek a brother who cannot die. That elder brother is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through the traumatic experience of watching his own flesh and blood brother tragically die at an early age, Robert Murray McShane committed his life to Jesus Christ. And that conversion launched McShane into a life of ministry that would last only 11 years. McShane himself would die at a very early age of 29. But those 11 years, though short chronologically, were deep and full years. As McShane in the 19th century, this great Scottish preacher, lived a life of radical commitment to Jesus Christ. And so completely dedicated himself to the Lord that he was a mighty instrument in the hand of God that brought about seasons of revival in the church of Scotland. He was called by God into the ministry and immediately ran to that which God had summoned him to with unwavering resolve and total abandonment to Christ. Few young men have ever been so wholeheartedly dedicated to Christ. McShane in his journals would record this often quoted prayer. Lord, make me as holy 
as a pardoned sinner can be. He would say, the greatest need of my people is my personal holiness. It was McShane's godliness that overshadowed even his giftedness. And he was mightily used by God in those few years. He was a sickly young man and was told by his doctors that, that he would die. That he needed to live in a, a different climate to extend his years. McShane got on a boat in Scotland and sailed to Israel for the arid climate there in the Middle East. Was told to rest. And McShane so sold out to Jesus Christ that the time that he had there in Israel, he spent evangelizing the Jews and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and pushing himself for the cause of Christ to the very extremities. He recovered somewhat, got on a boat, returned to Scotland, and there resumed his pastorate. And in a short time, McShane died. Before he died, he wrote this in his journal. Set not your heart on the flowers of this world, for they all have a canker in them. Prize the rose of Sharon more than all, for he changes not. Live nearer to Christ than anyone else, so that when they are taken from you, you may have him to lean on still. Robert Murray McShane died at age 29 and literally burned himself out for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He lived with such abandonment to Christ that he held nothing back. He invested his entire life with supreme devotion to Christ. He was like Jonathan Edwards, who in one of his 70 resolutions said, Resolved that I be this man in this generation who is most fully sold out to Christ. Though he had only 11 years in his Christian life, the effect of one life sold out to Christ was as though he lived 11 lifetimes. Far more important than how long you live is the depth of your life, the fullness of your life. How committed you are to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ. In this text, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, this is what God is beseeching us to do. To be sold out to Jesus Christ. To surrender our lives entirely, even daily, to Jesus Christ. To turn a deaf ear to the world. To live with abandonment to the will of God for our lives. I want to ask you, how is it with your soul this morning? For what are you living? What consumes you? What preoccupies you? What dominates your thoughts, your ambitions, your dreams, your aspirations, your life? Better for you to die at age 29 and to be radically committed to Jesus Christ and to leave it all for the Lord in this life in service for Him and for you to waste your life and live to 70 or to 80 years of age in mediocrity for Christ. I want us to look at this text. I, I want it to speak to our hearts yet again. And I want you to note several headings with me as we work our way through this text. I want you to follow, follow me as we go through this text. I want God to speak to your heart as His Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. I want you to note first the motivation. Why should you live this way? There are secondary motivations. There are primary. There is a primary motivation. 
A secondary motivations would be, well, I should live this way because mom and dad would expect me to live this way. And you should honor your father and your mother. But there is a primary motivation that surpasses every other motivation. You should live this way because of the sovereign grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that has been demonstrated towards you. Notice how he begins this. Verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. You see that word urge? Paul is giving us a, a strong word of exhortation. Paul is not a stoic. Paul is not just putting options out in front of us and, and encouraging us with certain preferences. You can take it. You can leave it. No, he is saying, I urge you to live this way. And standing behind Paul is our triune God. And this is the urging of God upon our hearts and lives. God is very passionate about this. As God is urging you and pleading with you to give your life to Christ in total commitment and surrender to Him. This comes with all of the passion and emotion of God Himself. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, it's directed to us as believers, those of us who have already committed our lives to the Lordship of Christ, those of us who are already on board with the Lord, those of us who have already entered through the narrow gate, and we are on the narrow path that is headed for life, we have already turned our back to the world. We've burned our bridges behind us. We are following with loyalty and allegiance to Jesus Christ. I urge you, therefore, brethren, and here is the motivation, here is the appeal, by the mercies of God. And the mercies of God here refer to the entirety of of the saving grace of God that has brought about our eternal salvation. In reality, it is the summary of Romans 1 through 11. By that little phrase, by the mercies of God, Paul is putting his arms around the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. He is saying, you need to consider where you once were before you were in Christ. We were all under the wrath of God. We were the object of His holy wrath. We had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There was the poison of ass under our, lip, under our tongue. Our feet were quick to shed blood. We did not seek God. We went astray from Him. We were in sin. That's where we once were. And consider what the Lord did for you. God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God sent forth His Son in the fullness of time, born of a woman, born under the law, that He might redeem us who were under the law. And He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He bought us with His own blood. And He has set us free. And consider how your life has been changed. We once were slaves of sin and ungodliness. And we have been redeemed and set free. We have been resurrected in Christ. And we now live a new life in Christ. Every one of us who are truly in Christ, our lives have been changed by the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And consider what we have become. We have become sons of God and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We have been adopted into God's family. And there is a full inheritance that has already been entrusted to us. The Holy Spirit has been granted to us. And there is coming the fullness of our inheritance one day. And consider what God is now doing in your life. 
For we know that God causes all things to work together for our good. Those who are called according to his purpose, those who love God. How God is taking every circumstance, every trial, every event, both in the macro as well as in the micro, and God is taking it all, and God is orchestrating it all, and God is designing it all for His glory and for your good. That is what God is doing in your life this very moment. And Paul says, by the mercies of God, I beseech you, I urge you to live in this way. I want to say to you, if that does not motivate you, as we say in Alabama, if, if that doesn't ignite your heart, then your wood is wet. Then nothing will excite your heart. Nothing will motivate you of any real lasting significance. As you look into your soul, as you look into your heart this day, are you truly motivated by the mercies of God and the grace of God that has been demonstrated to you in Christ Jesus? This should hit the beaches of our hearts like a spiritual tsunami and overwhelm us and overshadow us and flood our soul and fill us up to overflowing with motivation to do what he calls us to do. Now second, not only the motivation, I want you to see the presentation. Paul now calls for decisive commitment on our parts. He's not calling us to be saved, that's already happened. But he is calling us to live our spiritual lives in a particular way. And he says in verse 1, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, here it is, to present your bodies, a living sacrifice, a living and holy sacrifice. The entire picture here is of the Old Testament sacrificial system. How a priest would take a sacrifice and slay it and kill it. And with its, with his own hands, he would bring it to the altar. And he would place this, this dead sacrifice upon the altar and it would be offered up to God. And it would become a, a sweet smelling aroma that would ascend upward to the throne of God. Of course, it was all symbolic of, of of the Lord Jesus Christ who, as our great high priest, offered up himself as the sacrificial lamb to be the atonement for our sins. And there was the end of the sacrificial system. And the veil in the temple was rent top to bottom. And now we as believers constitute a holy priesthood. And we all have access to God. And we can come before His throne of grace. And as priests of God, with access to God, we must never come with empty hands. Uh, worshipers are givers to God. And as we come to God, we are to bring a sacrifice. Not a sacrifice that would represent an atonement for sin, because Christ is the end of the law. We are to present ourselves as a living and holy sacrifice to God. This is the worship that God desires of us. He says, present your bodies. In other words, give yourself supremely to Christ, to God. When he says bodies, it is to represent the totality of who we are and what we are. From the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. We are to be entirely sold out to Jesus Christ. We are to give Him our minds, what we think about, our thoughts, our dreams, our, our ambitions, our, our secret life, our private thoughts. 
We are to give Him our eyes, what we look upon, what we see, what we gaze upon. We are to give Him our ears, what we listen to, what we hear throughout the day. We are to give Him our mouths, what we say, what we speak, what we communicate, what we share. We are to give Him our hands, what we do, what we lay hold of. We are to give Him our feet, where we go, what we pursue, the path and the direction that we go. This is God's design for every one of us here today. That we be continually and always coming before God and presenting all that I am and all that I have to all that He is. He says we're to be a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, there were dead sacrifices that were presented to God. And now in the New Testament, we are to present our bodies as a, a living, holy sacrifice. And that is to say we are to live for God. We are to live for Christ. We are to be alive unto God. And we are to truly live for the things of God and for the things of His kingdom. And this is that for which we have been made. And we are to be a holy sacrifice. And we are to be set apart from the things of this world. And we are to be totally given to God. And we cannot have one foot in the church and, and one foot in the world or one foot in Christ and, and dabble with having being a part of the things of the world. No, we are to be totally given to God while we are in this world. In the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, the priests were bringing their sacrifices to God. And they were bringing to God... The defective animals, the blind, the lame, the leftovers. After they kept for themselves the, the healthiest of the sacrifices that they might sell them in the marketplace and have more money. And God speaks in the book of Malachi and God says, no, you give those leftover defective sacrifices to your own fathers. You give them to yourselves. You bring to me the best of your sacrifice. That is what, what Paul is calling for here. That you give to God the best hours of your day. You give to God the first fruit of what He puts into your hands. That you give to God the very best that you have to offer Him. And in reality, it is the entirety of your entire life. This is the presentation. And He says it is acceptable to God. Later in verse 2, the word acceptable will be repeated and that will be acceptable to us. But in verse 1, it is acceptable to God. The only way for you to live your Christian life in a manner by which it is acceptable to God is for you to be sold out, surrendered, and radically committed to Jesus Christ. Let me simplify it. If you please God... It does not matter whom you displease. And if you displease God, it does not matter whom you please. All that matters is, is my life acceptable to God? This is the presentation that every one of us here must make. And so I want to ask you the question... Right now, this moment, this day, is your life presented to God, totally sold out to Jesus Christ. Those of you who are believers, those of you who are in Christ, does our practice match our position? That is what Paul is calling for here. You're saying none of us is free to pursue, pursue our own agenda, to pursue our own plans, 
to pursue our own dreams and aspirations. That we have one agenda item in our lives. And it is to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God. Well, he tells us at the end of verse 2 that we will come to realize the will of God. But we must first present ourselves to him. Is your life, metaphorically speaking, is your life on the altar this moment? Are you a living sacrifice? Are you living for God? Are you living for Christ? Is he the supreme passion and desire of your life? Are you a holy sacrifice? Are you pursuing holiness? Are you pursuing godliness? Motivated by the mercies of God. This is incumbent upon every one of us here today. I want you to note third, the calculation. Please note how verse 1 continues. He concludes verse 1 by saying, which is your spiritual service of worship. What he is saying here is you need to carefully think this through. This word for spiritual, legizomai, is the word which comes into our English language as logic or logical or logarithms. And what Paul is saying is, Every one of us needs to, to do the math on this. This is the most rational, logical presentation of your life you need to make based upon what God has done for you in your life. And what he is saying is for you to live for the world, for you to live for yourself, for you to live for somebody else is totally irrational, it is illogical, it is insane for us to live for anyone else. When I was in college, I was a finance major and I took many accounting classes. And we had the T-square and there was profits and, and losses, there were assets, there were liabilities. And you would add it up. What all assets did we have going for us? What all liabilities needed to be subtracted out? And Paul is saying you need to make a T-square for your life. And you need to add up the assets and the, li the liabilities for committing your life to Christ. And Paul says when you add up all of the mercies of God... And the, the favor and the grace of God that has been bestowed upon you, it far outweighs the sacrifices, the, the persecution, the opposition, the resistance that we would feel on this side. We gain far more in Christ than we are now called upon to face. That is what he is saying here. He says you need to add it up and live your life in a calculated way. I've said before, sin makes you stupid. Sin in your life will always lead you to make stupid decisions with your life. It is irrational to ever sin. Yet we do. Because of indwelling sin, but we often forget to add it up. James Montgomery Boyce, great Bible teacher, gives five things we need to think through to add it up. The calculation. One, what God has already done for you. We need to think that through and put that on the asset side. Second, what God is doing for you in your life this very moment. Third, it is God's will for your life to live this way. Fourth, God is worthy of your total sacrifice, allegiance, and loyalty. Fifth, only spiritual things will last. 
how illogical to live for the temporal passing things of this world. That is the ultimate buy high, sell low deal. That is wasting your life. That is throwing your life away. Your life will be squandered to live only for the things of this world. How we must live for eternal things, for God's kingdom. Boyce says that it is the most intelligent, spiritually speaking, decision you will ever make in your life to totally, completely give yourself to Jesus Christ on an ongoing basis. Have you done the math on this? Have you really thought this through? Do you really want to just pour your life like water into desert sand and for there to be no eternal significance? Or do you not want your life to be lived for the fullest? If so, then you must present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God. Now notice fourth, the insulation. At the beginning of verse 2, he says we've got to remain insulated from the world. Now this does not mean isolation. It means insulation. Too many Christians want to just withdraw to a commune out in some place by themselves. There's no holiness in a hole. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. We are to have our boat in the water, but no water in the boat. But our boat is not to be on dry land. Notice what he says in verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. That implies that we are out there penetrating this world. That we have no reverse gear. We have only forward drive. And that we are going into all of the world. We are rubbing shoulders with the world. We are going into the highways and the byways of this world. We are standing on the rooftops of this world. And we are living in the midst of, of this world. But he says we are not to be conformed to this world. The word conformed, it's been said, it means do not be squeezed into the mold. It's an imperative, meaning this is a command. It's present tense. We are to always be not being conformed. Do not be conformed to this world. World here refers to this present evil age. It refers to this godless age that is anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-truth, that is man-centered, in which all things are from man, through man, and to man. We are not to buy into the system, the world's values, the world's priorities, the world's perspectives, the world's secular philosophies. How does Psalm 1 begin? How blessed is the man who does not stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. And we are to be that tree that is rooted and grounded in the Word of God. But we are to turn a deaf ear to the worldly ideologies and the secular humanism and the godless thinking of this world. As you watch television, as you go on the internet, as you look at magazines, as you penetrate the world, either the world is a mission field or you are the mission field. Either you are influencing the world or the world is influencing you. Are you becoming more like the world or is the world becoming more influenced by Christ as a result of your life? A 
what Paul is saying is do not give in to the world. Do not let your guard down. Because the world is never idle. And the devil is never asleep. And there are forces of hell that are aggressive. And the temptations and snares and schemes of the evil one is after us. This is the insulation that we must have. And I trust that there, that there is a, a protective insulation around you. That there are things you will not set your eyes on. There are things you will not take into your ears. And he who would not fall down ought not to walk in slippery places. I want you to notice fifth, the transformation. And there must be this inward positive transformation in our lives. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This refers to a radical change of heart and mind and soul being transformed into the image of Christ, of being conformed into Christ's likeness. Now, this word renew is, is a word from which we derive the English word metamorphosis. It speaks of not the superficial external facade change, but the inward radical spiritual prog progress in sanctification that must take place on the inside. And would you please note the emphasis upon the mind, but be, re be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me tell you how your life works, from the mind to the heart to the will. Your mind controls the affections and the affections control the will. And so what is coming into your mind has an effect on your heart and what is in your heart governs and steers and directs the steps that you take in life. And for the Word of God to be coming into your mind sets you on one course and for the filth and the depravity of this world to be coming into your mind, set your steps on a totally different path. He says you need to be transformed from the inside by the renewing of your mind. Do you sense that your mind is being elevated? Do you sense that your mind is becoming more transcendent? Uh, do you sense that, that your mind is becoming more and more the mind of Christ? Do you see with a Christian worldview? Do you size up the world around you and the situations with a renewed mind? Do you have discernment? Do you have insight? Do you have wisdom? It is the knowledge of the truth that shapes our entire inner person. It is the engine under the hood that is driving our lives. Notice finally, at the end of verse 2, the realization. What is the result? What is the bottom line? What is the outcome? What would it look like if, if I was sold out to Christ? If I, if I did come to Christ and say, oh Christ, here is my life. I have been living for peripheral things. I have been living for temporal things. I have been living for superficial things. I want to live for eternity. I want to live for those things that matter most in your kingdom. I want to live for time and eternity for Christ. I want to transcend all of the, 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 the low valleys of this world. What would be the result if you were to come to Christ this day and say, Oh Christ, I present to you from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, every inch, every ounce of me, I, am, I want to be sold out to you. Now he gives us the result. 
He says, so that you may prove. The word prove means to come to know by experience. You won't just know this intellectually. You will come to live this. You will come to, to, to be a part of the, the reality of this in your life. It will happen in your life. So that you may prove what the will of God is. The path that God has chosen for your life. God who is infinite wisdom. God who knows perfectly what is best for your life. That you may prove what the will of God is. Notice the three descriptives. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. Listen, this isn't like taking bad medicine in order to get well. This is the greatest blessing and satisfaction that could ever come to your life. It's good, meaning it leads to spiritual good, moral good. It leads to your good, God's glory, your good. You're settling for, for second best in your life if you don't live this way. That which is good and acceptable, meaning it will become acceptable to you. You will find pleasure in doing God's will. You will be thrilled to experience this. You won't be drug into this. You will, you will come running into this. Good and acceptable and perfect. That is to say, if you had a thousand lives and you could try to rechart your, the course of your life and you could come up with every conceivable possible alternative as you come to intersections in your life and you go one way or the other, if you had a thousand lifetimes to try to rechart a better plan and a better direction for your life, you could never improve upon it one iota because what God has already chosen for your life is absolutely, infinitely perfect. Any path you choose is imperfect. What God has chosen is complete, it's whole, it's lacking in nothing. It is the very best life you could possibly ever live. Every one of us this moment ought to respond to the truth of these verses and come to the place where we humble ourselves before God and say, God, I want to live for you. I want to be sold out for you. I want to be surrendered to you. I want to be all in with you. I don't want side issues. I don't want peripheral issues. I don't want secondary issues. I want to live for what's primary. I want to live for what's eternal. I want to live for what is highest. I want to live for what is perfect. I want to live for what is best. And if that is the desire of your heart, then it means that you would come to God in humility and that you would with lowliness of mind, present your bodies as a priest would present a sacrifice on the altar and you would say, God, take my mind, take my thoughts, take my time, take my strengths, take my gifts, Take whatever time is left that I have to live here upon the earth. Take my future. Take my present. Take everything that I am. Take all that I have. Take all that I ever will be. And God, I give it all entirely to you. All that I am and all that I will ever be. Would you come to that place today with God? 
When we came into the kingdom of God, we surrendered to the lordship of Christ. Paul is not talking about some second step. He is talking about that we acknowledge our original commitment to live under the lordship of Christ. Only one life, and it soon will be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. He is no fool who will give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Give your life entirely to Christ and follow him wherever he goes. Let us pray. Father, our desire here today is not to play games with you. It's not to waste your time nor our time. We believe that you have ordained that we would be in this place today and that we would stand before your word and that we would be called out today to live in a way that is acceptable and pleasing to you. I pray that there would be a wave of sobriety that would sweep over our soul. That there would be a sense for many of us here today that we would grow up, that we would mature, that we would step up to the next level, that we would reach out for Christ as never before, and that we would be willing to go anywhere at any time to pay any price to go with anyone. Lord, I am sold out to you. And Lord, I want to go back to my dorm room and live for you. I want to go into the classroom and live for you. I want to go into this community and live for you. I want to be alone in the Word and, and, and be with you and pray to you and worship you. Lord, I am yours. Father, I pray that this would be the true and earnest prayer of my brothers and sisters in Christ here today. May you lead on. May we follow. In Christ's name. Amen.